where the crowd it sings is a heartbreaking story about child abandonment, loneliness, and survival. It's about the aftermath of human prejudice and growth without guidance. Left by her entire family as a child, nature became Kaya's only family. She studied it and spent time with it. In return, it nurtured and shaped her. The villagers deemed her to be too wild and unfit for their world. Without the privilege and chance that many are blessed with, Kaya learned to make her own way in life. Though well equipped with skills and smarts for survival, Kaya began craving company. Her life is forever changed when interaction comes in the form of two boys, one of which will die mysteriously. The small town of Barkley Cove needs to make a decision once and for all if Kaya, a creature of their making over years of rejection and ridicule, is deserving of the accusation for first-degree murder. As a family, the Clarks were built on a lie. In his prime, Jake was a beautiful man who came from a rich family. He fell in love with the lovely Maria who was visiting from out of town. Over a drink, he laid out all his plans of studying law and living grand. As the Great Depression unfolded, his family had slowly lost all their riches and Jake had to quit school. Despite becoming poor, he still wanted to wed Maria. He stole whatever valuable items his family still had left and pawned them off for money. With that money, he wooed Maria and won her over. They got married and as Jake's money ran out, he started working for her family. It wasn't long before he grew unsatisfied and began drinking, gambling, and staying out nightly. Maria implored him to work harder so he could climb the ladder but he simply fell in deeper with his bad habits. In fact, he quit the job and sold everything of value in their home. Then he moved Maria and their children out to his family cabin somewhere far away, with the promise that he would fix the place up and complete school. He would fail to keep this promise and grow to be a hopeless drunk. The only good thing to come out of the move was their fifth and final child, Kaya. She was the product of a romantic boat ride, the only time Jake ever brought Maria. Kaya would grow up knowing nothing about her parents' past or how life could have been if her father had actually tried rather than throw everything away out of pride. She knows her mother's warmth, wise words, love, and laughter kept them alive. She knows the great effort her mother made to build a home out of nothing for them. She knows the violence her mother and siblings all endure at the hands of her father. She knows that her father is the reason why her mother, having grown to become an empty shell of a person over years of empty promises and torture, finally walked out the door. She knows that her father's actions drove all her siblings away after their mother left. It was no longer a home without the glue that held them together. She knows that her favorite sibling Jody tried to stay but failed to bear Jake's incessant abuse in the end. She knows very well that her father is the reason she's left all alone in the marsh with no family and no place to run to. One night, Jake threw a bag onto the kitchen floor. He explained that she could use the bag to store her collection. He had noticed her picking up random objects of the wild such as bird feathers from around the area. It was the first thing he had ever given Kaya. As time went on, he taught her all the skills one would need to survive in the marsh. He knew a lot and she had endless questions. Some days, they even had picnics. Kaya and Jake were unexpectedly warming up to each other and learning how to live together in their own way. For a good while, it seemed like things might work out. Kaya could picture her mother coming home and the three of them being a regular family. She kept everything at home in perfect order, awaiting her mother's return. Finally, the day came when there was a letter in the mailbox. She may not know how to read but she knew her mother's handwriting. Kaya put the letter where her father was sure to see, waiting for him to tell her its contents. She would never in her lifetime find out what it was that her mother had to say. In a rage, her father burned it and simply left. The next time he came home, Jake had reverted into the man Kaya's mother had walked away from and not the father Kaya had come to know. After some time, he stopped coming home altogether and was never seen again. The Clarks, originally a family of seven, is now a family of one very lonely little girl. Having been raised in the marsh, Kaya was never going to be accepted by the townspeople. They didn't want her around and blamed her for any diseases. She was too different for their liking. Her clothes, appearance, mannerism, speech, and way of life, and it earned her the nickname Marsh Girl. Teasing, mocking, and playing cruel jokes on her became the norm for other children. When she attended school and the kids learned she couldn't spell, they had laughed at her. She never went back again. Chase Andrews was a star in the town where he grew up. He was an adorable child who grew up to be a good-looking quarterback, celebrated by the men and loved by the women. Chase loved them right back, sleeping with an uncountable number of them before finally marrying his childhood friend. Despite getting married, he never settled down entirely. He still fooled around with many women. Chase Andrews had it all, popularity, looks, love, talent, and career, but Chase Andrews was nothing but a dead body floating in the North Carolina swamp on the 30th of October 1969. People might have thought Chase Andrews simply left or got lost elsewhere in the world, if not for the two young villagers recognizing his jacket in the swamp. The swamp's unforgiving nature meant that ordinarily, he would have been swallowed whole. Just as luck had been on his side all his life, it allowed his body to be discovered in death instead. Nothing on the scene suggested foul play. In fact, everything pointed towards the direction of an accident. Yet somehow, his death would be investigated as a murder. Plenty of people had reason enough to want him dead. Yet there would only be one suspect, Kaya Clark, also known as the Marsh Girl. It was true she didn't know how to spell simple words. They had laughed but failed to learn that she knew more than they would ever learn in school. 
There was no limit or end to what Kaya knew, shells, seabirds, tides, or plants, in regards to the nature surrounding her and all that it contains. She knew about different specimens, their locations, and the specific conditions required for them to survive. She knew their habits and patterns. Growing up alone in the marsh made every living and non-living thing within it her family. She grew, exploring, discovering, learning, collecting, tracking, healing, and became one with nature. For several years of her life, Kaya made money to survive from selling fish, mussels, and oysters to Jumpin. Seeing how skinny and poor Kaya was, Jumpin tried his best to help. Along with his wife Mabel, they collected clothes and food for her. Over the years, they would stay in Kaya's life. Jumpin taught her how to fix her boat up. Mabel was there when she had her first period. Jumpin was the one who told her which library she could go to for more books when she finally learned to read. They tried their best to provide her with anything that she might need. Jumpin and Mabel were all the friends and family Kaya had. People in town didn't always treat Jumpin right either. The children had called him nigger but he never reacted. He simply walked on. One time, Kaya tossed a bag filled with jam jars at the boys who did this. Later in life, Kaya would become a published nature author. Jumpin didn't say anything when she gifted him with her book. But whenever she went by, she could see her book proudly displayed by the window of Jumpin's store. They watched out for and took care of each other as a family would. On an unsupervised boat ride when Kaya was seven, she had bumped into Jody's friend. Tate had helped her get home when she got lost. There was something about him that drew Kaya in immediately. She knew that she wanted this boy in her life but several years would pass without any interaction. Then one day when she was 14, Tate left a unique feather for her where she frequented. They continued gifting each other rare finds and gifts for a while before finally talking. They had a shared interest in the marsh and the unique organisms within it. Kaya would watch the same group of friends over the years from a safe distance. It was during one of these times that Chase Andrews noticed her. It wasn't long before he approached Kaya with a specific goal in mind. He wanted to win an ongoing bet that the boys in town had of who would get her virginity. He certainly didn't plan on discovering that Kaya was smart and interesting or on actually falling in love with her. Kaya wasn't in love with Chase but she wanted his company. He was a light in the dark days she's had since losing Tate. Chase often talked about their future together, a home, marriage, and an introduction to his family and friends. Over time, he won her over and they did sleep together. They continued spending time together in secret. Chase was a good person when he's with Kaya but quite a jerk when he's with the rest. Despite all his plans and promises, he would end up marrying someone else without even telling Kaya. Tate came home from college with a plan to marry Kaya. The plan was to get his PhD, work in a lab nearby Kaya, and stay with her forever. He knew now what he didn't back then, he needed Kaya in his life. The whole time that he was away, the girl never left his mind. When he finally made his way over to her, he saw Chase and knew he was too late. Tate had heard Chase running his mouth all over town about Kaya. He wanted to warn her but knew it wasn't in his place. He still went over to apologize for his mistake and ask for forgiveness. The years hadn't soothed Kaya's anger over his absence. Deep down inside, she still cared but knew she had to protect herself from the damage he was capable of. She didn't know how to fully forgive him but thought that friendship with the boy who was once her everything seemed nice. Kaya continued dating Chase and Tate went on to be a scientist at the new lab nearby. Tate did something for Kaya that no one else ever did, he made sure that she could thrive and not just simply survive. During Tate's visit, he saw how Kaya's nature collection had grown. After learning how to read Kaya started to label every item with great detail. He encouraged her to get these books published by finding her a publisher. Kaya was able to share her passion with the world and live out the rest of her life as an accomplished naturalist and author. When the money from the books started coming in, Kaya used it to improve her house. She got all the necessities she never had, like a heater, refrigerator, electricity, running water, and furniture. She fixed the house up, leaving only her mother's stove untouched. She even had enough money to buy the land, which had belonged to her grandfather. After a lifetime of having nothing, Kaya finally had her own little place in the world. Tate's kindness had changed the entire course of her life. Life has never been amazing for Kaya, but it was finally going okay. She had a home, work she cared about, and her land. It allowed her to discover new things every day. Kaya was out looking for a specific type of mushroom one day when Chase snuck up on her. Kaya didn't want to talk to him. He forcefully kissed her and took her pants off. When she pushed him away, he hit her. She would not let herself be a victim. Nobody was around to hear her screaming. Furious, she dug deep within for the strength to fight back. She hit him on his jaw, then his groin. She got away as fast as she could, turning back only to check if he was coming after her. Instead of Chase, she saw two fishermen looking at her. She was certain if it came down to her or Chase, they would not believe her. They probably would say she deserved it. Kaya was going to have to keep this a secret and keep herself out of sight for a while. In this town, Chase was loved and Kaya was hated. Most people believe Kaya was guilty before she was even convicted. She had never been so alone in her whole entire life. Chase's mother had come forward to the police to raise the issue of a missing shell necklace from his body. He always wore it, and she knew it was from Kaya. She never acknowledged the rumors of her son fooling around with the marsh girl but she knew it was true. The fishermen also came forward to tell the police about the time Chase had assaulted her. They overheard Kaya telling Chase that she'd kill him if he didn't leave her alone. 
It didn't help that two other people said they had seen her boat in the water the night of Chase's death. There was no murder weapon, prints, or sufficient evidence. The timeline didn't even fit. Kaya was out of town, having dinner with her publisher the night of the murder. The hotel front desk agent saw her go into her room without coming out again. Some people in town said they saw Kaya leave on the bus too. It was a big deal because she never goes anywhere. Kaya's lawyer reasoned for the jury to be fair with an abandoned child who had been unfairly treated all her life for once. He pointed out that Kaya was only different because everyone made sure she didn't have a shot at normalcy. After much deliberation, the jury found Kaya not guilty of the murder she was accused of. Each day, Tate made coffee and Kaya cooked. Then they went out exploring, swimming, and collecting items together. They hired someone to build Kaya's studio as well as expand the house. Kaya continued publishing nature books. They tried but failed to produce any children. Jody often brought his wife and children over to visit. All of them would sit in the kitchen, eating together like a proper family. There were laughter and love. Kaya never completely healed from the hurt of her life, but she was content with where her life got to be in the end. Chase's murder was never solved and people kept talking about it long after. Most people would come to accept that Kaya was innocent, but she never went into town ever again. After a lifetime of wanting company, Kaya finally wanted to be left alone. She didn't want to be involved with anyone anymore, with the exception of Tate. He was the only person who ever truly cared about her.